So this morning we're going to start talking about Edmund Burke and the anti-enlightenment. Um, and, and one prefatory note is that um, when thinking about political theory as opposed to everyday political argument, I think it's very important not to get hung up on labels such as left wing or right wing or liberal or conservative. Uh, and I think the occasion of beginning to speak about Burke is a good uh, moment to make this point. After all, uh, I think it'd be fair to say that before you walked into this course, you would have, if you had looked down the syllabus and somebody had said, who is the most radical thinker on this syllabus, most of, the, most of you would have picked out Marx. Um, but as we've seen, Marx is actually a footnote to the Enlightenment. Marx is not, he's not somebody who engages in a radical departure from the ideas that were developed by um, Locke and the other thinkers that shaped the main ideas of the Enlightenment. Burke, on the other hand, is generally thought of as a conservative politically, and indeed he was a conservative politically, but philosophically he's a much more radical thinker than Marx was. He is somebody who uh, re really goes to the root of accepted assumptions in his critical questioning. Um, Burke completely rejects the Enlightenment project as I have un uh, described it to you today. Um, let me say a little bit about who he was. He was born in 1829, uh, uh, so that makes him, I mean 1729, sorry, gave him 100 years there. He was born in 1729, a quarter of a century after Locke died. Um, and the main work for which he's most known, the, his reflections on the revolution in France, was published in 1790, almost, a, almost exactly a century after um, actually more like 110 years uh, after Locke's second treatise. Well, I should say it was published 100 years after, but it was written 110 years after because we now know that Locke wrote the second treatise in the, in the early 1680s. Um, but what motivated Burke to write his reflections on the French Revolution was the, the um, appalling carnage that eventually resulted from the French Revolution. Uh, the, you know, the, the French Revolution was not planned uh, as a revolution. It was really street riots that escalated in, in, in Paris, but escalated to the point of the complete destruction of the whole society, uh, the inauguration of a massive terror, uh, which uh, um, appalled Burke. And um, so he wrote this, this uh, what started out as a pamphlet, but, but became this very famous book on the reflections on the revolution in France. And that becomes the basis of Burke's outlook. Um, he wasn't a professional scholar or academic. He was actually a, a public uh, person. He, was, he would eventually become a member of parliament. Um, and has some things to say about democratic representation that I will come back to uh, when we get to the theory of democracy. But at the time he wrote the Reflections on the Revolution in France, which is what I had you read excerpts from today, um, he was mainly preoccupied with what had happened, what had transpired across the channel uh, in 1789. And he was in particular um, concerned to establish against people like Richard Price, who's one of the people who he engages there, that, that 1789 was in any sense a logical follow-on of 1688 in England. 1688, of course, when uh, we had the revolution in England, the glorious revolution of 1688, um, when, when William was put on the throne, which, which Locke defended, um, uh, but from Burke's point of view, that was a minor palace affair, not a fundamental or radical revolution. And in this sense, uh, Locke's view 
uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, Burke's view of the English Revolution, for those of you who are historians here, you might be interested to know, is very much at odds with the, the big new book called 1688, just recently published by Professor Pincus in the history department here, a very interesting book, um, which argues that 1688 was a much more radical break uh, with the past than uh, people thought at the time, and certainly than Burke thought, because Burke thought that 1688 was not a radical break with the past, whereas 1789 in France was a radical break with the past. And I think that um, another thing to say before we get into the particulars of Burke's view is that unlike everybody else you've read in this course, Burke really does not have a theory of politics. He does not have um, a set of premises that you can lay out, um, conclusions to which he wants to get, and then chains of reasoning that get him from A to B, from the premises to the conclusion. There is no theory of politics in Burke. There's no, dis, you know, we think of Kant, we talk about universalizability, um, Locke, we talk about this commitment to, uni to principles of, of scientific certainty. Um, Burke has, rather than a theory, he has an attitude or a disposition, an outlook. Um, and that outlook is, in, is informed first and foremost by extreme distrust, not only of science, but of anybody who claims to have um, scientific knowledge. He thinks that human society is way too complicated for us ever to get completely to the bottom of. That we are kind of uh, carried along on a wave of very complicated history that we understand only dimly, if at all, and that that's not going to change. The human condition is a condition, first and foremost, of fumbling in the dark. He says, uh, just to give you a flavor of this, the science of constituting a commonwealth, or renovating it, or reforming it, is, like every other er experimental science, not to be taught a priori. So here you can see complete resistance to the, the logical reasoning uh, that drove Hobbes and Locke and, Locke and thinking about the structure of mathematics uh, and a system of axioms of the sort Bentham uh, tried to come up with, no, says Bird. Nor is it a short experience that can instruct us in that practical science, because the real effects of moral causes are not always immediate but that which in the first instance is prejudicial may be excellent in its remoter operation. So when we think we see something bad, it might be having a good effect. And its excellence may arise even from the ill effects it produces at the beginning. The reverse also happens. And very plausible schemes with very pleasing commencements have often, have often shameful and lamentable conclusions. In states that are often, there are often some obscure and almost latent causes, things which appear at first view of little moment, on which a very great part of its prosperity or adversity may es essentially depend. So, um, the world is fundamentally mysterious and murky, and things that look good might have bad consequences, things that look bad might have good consequences, the effects of our actions are going to be uh, realized in the distant future in ways that we can't possibly imagine. Um, and so, that being the case, the most important characteristic of thinking about politics is caution. We should be caution. The science of government being there so practical in itself, 
and intended for such practical purposes, a matter which requires experience, and even more experience than any person can gain in his whole life, however sagacious and observing he may be, it is with infinite caution that any man ought to venture upon pulling down an edifice which has answered in any tolerable degree for ages the common purposes of society, or on building it up again without having models and patterns of approved utility before his eyes." So what they did in the French Revolution was the antithesis of what Burke recommends, because they swept everything away and decided to build again tabula rasa. Burke is deeply suspicious of all attempts to do that, and he thinks they'll end in disaster, um, because the people who undertake them will not know what they're doing, and even more dangerous, they're not smart enough to know how dumb they are. They're not smart enough to realize that they de really do not know what they're doing. They're not smart enough to understand that they will unleash forces which they will not be able to control. So Burke is, in that sense, a conservative who thinks about social change in a very cautious and incremental way. He's not a reactionary in the sense of being someone who's opposed to all change. He's a conservative, right? One of the, I think one of the nice definitions of conservatism in Burke's sense was actually put forward uh, by Sir Robert Peel in the 19th century when he said, he defined conservatism as changing what you have to in order to conserve what you can. Changing what you have to in order to conserve what you can, as distinct from a reactionary view, which would be just flat resistance to all change. Um, now, uh, of course, this idea of conservatism as valuing tradition is very different from the libertarian conservatism of Robert Nozick that we looked at uh, uh, earlier in the course. Um, the, the libertarian conservatism of Robert Nozick is anti-statist, anti-government, and resistance to authority being imposed on you, hence the notion of libertarian conservatism. Burke is a traditionalist conservative. He thinks that tradition is the core uh, of human experience, and he thinks whatever wisdom we have about politics is embedded in the traditions that we have inherited. They have served us over centuries. This is his view writing at the end of the 18th century. They have served us for centuries. They have evolved in a glacial way. As I said, people make accommodations to uh, change, but only in order to conserve the inherited system of norms, practices, and beliefs and institutions that we reproduce going forward. So that's the sense in which it's a conservative tradition, to conserve, the, the basic meaning of the word, conserve, conservative. Okay, and so science is a really bad idea when applied to political and social arrangements because there isn't scientific knowledge and anybody who claims to have it is either a charlatan or a fool, perhaps both. Um, and so that's his, as I said, he doesn't have a theory because he's skeptical of the very possibility of having a theory. He thinks um, we, should, we should, as Clint Eastwood says, uh, I've forgotten in which movie it is, I think A Fistful of Dolls maybe, a man's got to know his limitations, right? Are you feeling lucky? A man's got to know his limitations. Um, Burke thinks that in spades. He thinks we have to understand that our, our grasp of the human condition is very limited, and it's going to stay that way. So on the first of our two prongs of the Enlightenment um, endeavor, he's completely out of sympathy. 
Now, what about the second? What about the commitment to this idea of the importance of individual rights? We saw how this developed in, initially in Locke's formulation um, in a theological way when Locke argued that um, God created us with the capacity to behave in a godlike fashion in the world. Each individual uh, is the bearer of the capacity to create things and therefore have rights over his or her own creation. In Locke's view, we're all equal. We're equal in God's sight. He creates us all equally. And um, we're all uh, also equal in a sense, very important for Locke, that no earthly power has the authority to tell us what the scripture says. Each person must do it for themselves. And when they disagree, uh, they have to either find a mechanism to manage their disagreement, um, or if they can't, look for their reward in the next life. But basically, each individual is sovereign over themselves. And uh, that's where modern doctrines of individual rights come from. We saw how that played out with the workmanship ideal, uh, the Mills harm principle, um, all the way down through Nozick and Rawls. Bentham has, I'm sorry, Burke has a very, very different view of the idea of rights. They are, first of all, they are inherited. They're not the products of reason or um, any contrived theoretical formulations. They're inherited. You will observe that from revolution society from, that from revolution society to the Magna Carta, it has been the uniform policy of our Constitution to claim and assert our liberties as an entailed inheritance de derived to us from our forefathers and to be tra transmitted to posterity as an estate specially belonging to the people of this kingdom without any reference whatever to any other more general or prior right. By this means, our Constitution preserves a unity in so great a diversity of its parts. We have an inheritable crown, an inheritable peerage, and a house of commons in a people inheriting privileges, franchise, and liberties from a long line of ancestors. So what we think of uh, when we talk about rights for Burke, first of all, they're not human rights or natural rights. For him, they are the rights of Englishmen. They're the rights of Englishmen. They are particular rights. They're the result of a particular tradition. The idea that there could be universal rights doesn't make any sense. It's not an intelligible, it's not an intelligible question as far as Burke is concerned to us, say, what roles would say, what rights would we create for all people um, uh, in some abstract um, setting. Doesn't make any sense to him. So it's the rights of Englishmen. And indeed, when Burke, Burke was sympathetic to the American Revolution, not the French Revolution, it was because he thought that the rights of the American colonists as Englishmen were being violated by the English crown. And he was also uh, sympathetic to uh, home claims for home rule for Ireland, again on the same sort of basis. But it's, it's this entailed inheritance, what we have um, been born into as a system of rights and obligations that uh, we reproduce into the future. And they, those rights, above all, are limited. Again, just as our knowledge of the world is limited, so our rights, uh, in a normative sense, are limited. Governments is a contrivance of human wisdom to provide for human wants. Men have a right that these wants should be provided for by this wisdom. Among these wants is to be reckoned the want out of civil society of a sufficient restraint, a sufficient restraint upon their passions. We have a right to be restrained. Right? A very different notion than a right to create 
things over which we have authority, a right to be restrained. Society requires not only that the passions of individuals should be subjected, but that even in the mass and body, as well as the individuals, the inclinations of men should frequently be thwarted, their will controlled, and their passions brought into subjection. This can, be, can only be done by a power out of themselves and not in the exercise of its function subject to that will and to those passions which it is its office to bridle and subdue. It is this sense of the restraints on men as well as their liberties, in this sense the restraints on men as well as their liberties are to be reckoned among their rights. The restraints on men as well as their liberties are to be reckoned among their rights. But as the liberties and the restrictions vary with time and circumstance and admit to infinite modifications, they cannot be settled upon any abstract rule. Take that, John Rawls. And nothing is so foolish as to discuss them upon that principle. Okay, so we have a right to be restrained. We have a right, that, most importantly, that others are going to be restrained. Um, and and th that our passion should be controlled uh, is something that he insists is an important part of what we should think of under the general heading of what it is that people have rights to. One of the first motives to civil society and which becomes one of its fundamental rules is that no man should be the judge in his own cause. By this each person has at once divested himself of the first fundamental right of uncovenanted man, that is, to judge for himself and to assert his own cause. That's, that's not that different from Locke, that first part, after all Locke talks about the state of nature as being exactly a state in which we get to judge in our own cause. But for Locke we give it up in a conditional way. right? We never lose the right to revolution if society doesn't protect us. Then, and that's what he thought was triggered in 1688. Burke says no. He abdicates all right to be his own governor. He inclusively in a great measure abandons the right of self-defense, the first law of nature. Men cannot enjoy the rights of an uncivil and a civil state together. That he may obtain justice, he gives up his right of determining what it is in, what it is in points the most essential to him. That he may secure some liberty, he makes a surrender in trust of the whole of it. So he's saying, you could, you know, this, this to some extent has a Hobbesian flavor that, that Hobbes says um, if we don't have law we'll have civil war and so we have to give up um, freedom to authority. The difference is even in Hobbes' formulation there's ultimately the, the recognition that if society does not provide you with protection uh, you have a, a reasonable basis for resistance and for overthrowing it. But uh, in Locke's case, uh, I mean in, in, in Burke's case, uh, he doesn't want to concede even that because we cannot, once we've made the transition into civil society, we cannot go back. There is no turning back. We're, we are uh, part and parcel of this system of in, entailed inheritances and that is the human condition all the way to the bottom. Um, he doesn't reject completely the metaphor of the social contract, but he makes it indissoluble. He says, society is indeed a contract. Subordinate contracts for objects of mere occasional interest may be dissolved at pleasure. If I make an agreement with you to do something, we can agree to dissolve our agreement. But the state ought not to be considered as nothing better than a partnership agreement in a trade of pepper and coffee, calico or tobacco, or some other such law concern. 
to be taken up for a little temporary interest and to be dissolved by the fancy of the parties. It is to be looked on with other reverence, the it here is the state, is to be looked on with other reverence because, it's, because it is a, not a partnership in things subservient only to the gross animal existence of a temporary and perishable nature. It is a partnership in all science, a partnership in all art, a partnership in every virtue and in all perfection. As the ends of such a partnership cannot be attained in many generations, it becomes a partnership now this is the most famous sentence Burke ever wrote. It becomes a partnership not only between those who are living, but between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are yet to be born. Very different idea of the social contract, right? Partnership between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are yet to be born. Each contract of each particular state is but a clause in the general primeval contract of eternal society. So the law is not subject to the will of those, this is a flat rejection of workmanship, right? The law is not subject to will of those who, who by an obligation above them and infinitely superior are bound to submit their will to that law. The municipal, municipal corporations of that universal kingdom are not morally at liberty at their pleasure and on the speculations of a contingent improvement wholly to separate and set asunder the bonds of their subordinate community and to dissolve it into an unsocial, uncivil, unconnected chaos of elementary principles. So one way of just driving home the, the radical break here between his thought and the social contract theorists is um, that to mention that one of the standard criticisms that often gets made of social contract theory is, well, even if there was a social contract, you know, some people think of the adoption of the American Constitution as a kind of social contract. After all, it was ratified by the states. Actually, the Articles of Confederation had said it had to be Unan unanimously ratified, and they, they couldn't get that, so they changed it to three quarters of the Confederacy states. Still, it, there was an agreement of some sort, and it was ratified, and so on. But people often said, have often said, well, so what? So those people in the, in the 18th century made an agreement. I didn't. What has it got to do with me? Why should it be binding on subsequent? generations, and that's often been a critique of the idea of the social contract. Burke turns that reasoning on its head. Right? He's, he says, once we see that this social contract is multi-generational between the, the, the dead, the living, and those who are yet to be born, who are you, any given individual, who are you to think that you can upend it? What gives you the right to pull the rug out from under this, this centuries-old evolving social contract? Um, what gives you the right to take it away from those who haven't even been born, who are part of this eternal, uh, eternally, he even uses the word eternal, um, this eternally reproducing uh, social contract? So it's, it's a sort of mirror image of the critique which says, well, we never made it, so why should we be bound by it? He says, uh, it pre-existed it pre you, and you're going to predecease it, and you don't have the right, you don't have the authority to undermine it, because any rights you think you have are the product of this evolving contract. They're contained within it. So, Society is not subordinate to the individual, which is the most rock-bottom com commitment of the workmanship idea. On the contrary, the individual is subordinate to society. Right? Obligations come before rights. We only get uh, rights as a consequence of the social arrangements um, 
that give us our duties as well. So um, whereas the Enlightenment tradition makes the individual agent the sort of moral center of the universe, this um, godlike uh, individual uh, creating things over which uh, she or he has absolute sovereign control, uh, is replaced by the exact mirror image of the idea of an individual as subordinate to inherited communities, traditions, social arrangements, political institutions, um, uh, to which he or she is ultimately beholden. If there was a pre-collective condition, it's of no relevance to us now, because we can't go back to it. And any attempt to try, look across the English Channel and see what you're going to get. But that is the Burkean outlook, uh, in a nutshell. And it is, as I said, uh, the most fundamental critique of the Enlightenment it's possible to make. And this, even though the Enlightenment tradition, as we've dis the, we have um, studied it here, was um, unfolding in the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, this anti-Enlightenment undertow has always been there as well. Um, and you know, you could, not to make the metaphor do too much work, but you can really think of every wave of advancement in Enlightenment thinking um, washing down the beach uh, and producing an undertow of resistment, resistance and resentment against it. Uh, both philosophically, uh, and we're gonna, I'm going to start talking in a minute about 20th century Burkean figures, uh, but also politically. Um, you know, one story about the rise of fundamentalism and jihadism and um, ethnic separatism um, is this is all part of the, un the political undertow against the, the current form that the Enlightenment uh, political project is taking, which is globalization, uh, homogenization, the sort of McDonald's effect on the world, produces backlash against globalization where people affirm um, primordial looking attachments, even though they probably never know such thing as a genuinely primordial one. Um, uh, separatist uh, partial affiliations and allegiances, connections to doctrines which deny the scientific and rational project of the Enlightenment. And so just as globalization has been advancing, we've seen a resurgence of separatist, religious, uh, fundamentalist, uh, nationalist, and other kinds of identities. Quite the opposite, for example, of what Marx predicted. Marx predicted that things like nationalism, sectarian identifications, would go away. Uh, so he, he, and Lenin too, um, they thought that as as the principles of capitalism diffuse themselves throughout uh, the world, um, things like national attachments would go away. And indeed, on the, on the eve of the First World War, there was the Second Communist International, where they basically came out and said to the uh, workers of Europe, don't get involved in this national war. It's not in your interest. You have a common class interest across nations against the interests of employers across nations. And of course this fell on completely deaf ears. In 1916 the Second International pretty much disintegrated. And, and in fact, you know, one of the big paradoxes of the 20th century has been the, the persistence of things like nationalism through the first two uh, world wars and then in the, in the last part of the 20th century, this resurgence of religious uh, and other forms of traditionalist attachment uh, that are fundamentally antithetical to the Enlightenment project. So the Enlightenment has always produced reaction, undertow, rejection, often from the people who don't benefit from it. Um, 
And it's one of the ways in which I think the proponents of the Enlightenment have always been politically naive. They've always thought that as modernization and enlightenment diffuses itself throughout the world, um, these kinds of primitive thinking will go away. Well, turns out that they don't. And so one of the big tasks of political science uh, at the present time is to try and understand why, to try and understand uh, what the dynamics of um, political affiliation, identity, attachment really are. And so um, that's a Burkean agenda. Now if you fast forward from Burke to the middle of the 20th century, I had you read a short piece, very famous and important piece, by Lord Devlin, who was an English judge, like Burke, someone with Irish origins. Um, though some, a certain amount of um, ethnic ambiguity in both cases there, about just how much Irish, just how much English, but we need to detain ourselves with that in this course. Um, and he was commenting upon something called the Wolfenden Report, um, which was published in 1959 and by a, a commission that had been um, asked to, to tell the British Parliament what it should do about homosexuality and prostitution. And the Wilfenden Report had said the laws against them should be repealed. They should both be legalized. On the grounds, they didn't use these terms, but um, uh, this is the basic thought or the term we would use today, on the grounds that both homosexuality and prostitution are victimless crimes. Um, they are, to use the jargon of uh, our, our course, Pareto superior exchanges. They are voluntary transactions among consenting adults that don't harm anybody else. And uh, of course this was put in a different idiom because it was the 1950s, but that was essentially the point. They don't harm anybody, so it's just traditional prejudice, bigotry, that leads us to outlaw these things and we shouldn't do it. That was what the Wolfenden Report had said. And Burkean to the core, Lord Devlin says, no. Anyone, I don't know how caught up you are in the reading, any, anyone who has read Burke, uh, I'm sorry, Devlin, w w tell us why he thinks. Yeah, you get, we need to get you the mic. Why he thinks, why is it that Lord Devlin thinks over at the back there that the mere fact that there's no harm is not enough of a basis for legalizing homosexuality and prostitution? Yeah. He claims that it's not a, an, an attack against the individual but a harm against society. Okay, so what does that mean though? What, say it's a harm against society. I mean, how, what do you take, how do you unpack that in your own mind? Um, I guess it's uh, maybe an attack against the morals that society tends to agree to. Yeah, well, agreed, let's put a brackets around agreed. It's not clear what we mean by, but certainly the morals that are there, okay, and where do they come from? Where do those morals, I mean, so we have a moral code that says, homosexuality and prostitution are wrong, but so where does that come, you know, anyone, yeah. Well, he put a lot of weight on the basis of religion for deriving one's morals. Correct, religion, and interesting, look what he says about religion. He says, uh, morals and religions are inextricably joined. The moral standards generally accepted in Western civilization being those belonging to Christianity. Outside Christendom, there's a 1950s word, we don't say Christendom anymore, do we? Outside Christendom, 
other standards derive from other religions. Outside Christendom, other standards derive from other religions. In England, we believe in the Christian idea of marriage and therefore adopt monogamy as a moral principle. Consequently, the Christian institution of marriage has become the basis of family life and so part of the structure of our society. It is there not because it is Christian. This comes to the point about whether we've agreed. It is there not because it is a Christian. It got there because it is Christian but it remains there because it is built into the house in which we live and could not be removed without bringing it down. It's there not because it's Christian, it got there because it's Christian. It's a matter of history. It was a Christian civilization. So we have a Christian conception of morality. But he's not saying it's true. He's not saying the Christian set of beliefs about religion is true. He has no interest in, in the question of whether or not it's true. He's saying here, a different society might be glued together by a different religion, which wouldn't create monogamy. Um, it might create polygamy. And that would have its own history and its own system of rights and institutions uh, and everything that goes with that, right? So, it's, it's conservative in the sense of affirming tradition, but not conservative in the sense of saying there are absolute moral values. Um, neither Burke nor Devlin ventures any opinion on that subject. And he's, they say it's not even really important. Right. What's important is that the people in the society believe in these values. And if the people in the society don't believe in some system of values as authoritative, the society will fall apart. You can't put together a society just on the basis of interest. It needs more. It needs moral glue. So, so these, these folks, you could say, when I say they, they don't really have a theory, in the sense that we've looked at theories up until now in this course, it's because you could say, well, they're not political theorists. They're really sort of sociologists, right? They're really sociologists of stability. Because they're saying that it's necessary for a society to be stable that it's held together by this kind of moral glue of authoritative opinion. Okay? So when you say to Lord Devlin, when he's, when he's defending um, the outlawing of homosexual and prostitution, well, that's just your bigotry. His answer wouldn't be to deny that it's in some absolute sense an irrational position, but he would say every society needs its bigotry. Every society needs its prejudices. And so he doesn't appeal to rationality, but he does appeal to what he calls reasonableness. And what is reasonableness? It's basically the system of beliefs, as he puts it, of the man on the Clapham omnibus. We might today say the woman on the A train, reading the New York Post. Right? The, the, the prejudices of the average person. Th that is the basic yardstick, and if the average person is appalled by some practices, then they should be illegal. And that's the beginning and end of it. So what about that? 
you know, you could, you could fast forward it since he talks about homosexuality and what we call gay rights today. If you look at the American trajectory, 1986, this came up before the Supreme Court in a case called Bowers versus Hardwick. And they essentially took, took the Burke-Devlin position, that is, uh, states should be allowed to outlaw homosexuality because most people find it deplorable. A couple of years ago it came back to the court and they said, well, mores have evolved enough since 1986 that we're going to overturn Bowers versus Hardwick. Very Burkean, very, they're following the man on the Clapham omnibus, they're following the woman on the A train's prejudices, beliefs, and values. And that's as it should be. What about that? How many people find this appealing? Okay, only two. How many people find it unappealing? Okay, so we, we, we still have at least half undecided, right? What's unappealing about it? Yeah. Take, take the microphone. According to his perspective, we might still have a system of slavery in this country. According to this perspective, we would still have slavery in this country. Well, uh, I think he wouldn't concede the point that quickly. He would say what I just said about Bowers versus Hardwick, that uh, if if the views of the man on the Clapham omnibus evolve enough, then we can recognize change. Um, now you might want to not accept that because um, what if they haven't? You know, before, um, yeah, okay. Yeah, to refute that, I, I would just say that uh, our morals and our ideas of what is right and wrong are shaped by uh, the, the systems that we were born into, and consequently, mm -hmm. I, I feel like Burke and Devlin's system ascribes like a great deal of value to like the moral conceptions at, at the beginning of society, and thus like almost leads us to like a system of stasis in terms of our morality. Like there seems to be too much stasis and no ability to reevaluate given how our moral systems are shaped. I think that's right, and we will pick up with this on uh, on Monday, but. If you, think, if, if you think that the basic society structure is okay, you're likely to find this doctrine appealing. But if you think the basic structure of the society is deeply unjust, then you're likely to be affronted by this outlook, right? Because one person's reasonable morality is another person's hegemony. And we'll start with that idea next time.